Rise and shine, Mr. Freeman. Rise and shine. Not that I wish to imply you have been sleeping on the job. No one is more deserving of a rest, and all the effort in the world would have gone to waste until... Well, let's just say your hour has come again. The right man in the wrong place can make all the difference in the world. So wake up, Mr. Freeman. Wake up and smell the ashes. To City 17. You have chosen or been chosen to relocate to one of our finest remaining urban centers. I thought so much of City 17 that I elected to establish my administration here in the citadel so thoughtfully provided by our benefactors. I've been proud to call City 17 my home. And so, whether you are here to stay or Passing through on your way to parts unknown. Welcome to City 17. It's safer here. But this stuff, it's all I have left. <coughs> All right, I'm moving. Jeez. Are you the only ones Welcome. on that train? Welcome to City 17. You have chosen or been chosen Overwatch to stopped our train in the woods and took my husband for questioning. Cities. They said he'd be on the next so train. City 17 I'm not I sure when that was. Did they're, they're being nice, though, letting me wait for in him? In the Citadel so thoughtfully provided by our benefactor. I've been proud to call City 17 my home. And so, whether you are here to stay or passing through on your way... Don't drink the water. They put something in it to, to make you forget. I don't even remember how I got here. They're always, they're always departing, but they never arrive. And the ones that do arrive, they, they never leave. You never see them go. They're always full. No one ever gets on, but they're always, they're always departing, but they never arrive. And the ones that do arrive, they, they never leave. You never see them go, they're always full. No one ever gets on, but they're always, they're always departing, but they never arrive. I see, they took your suitcase too. They can't get away with this much longer. Welcome. Welcome to City the nerve 17. To go on. You have chosen or been chosen to relocate to Dr. Breen again? Remaining urban I was hoping I'd seen the last of him in City 14. I, so much of I wouldn't City say that too loud. That this is his base of operations. My administration here in the Citadel so thoughtfully provided by our benefactors. Wait a minute. I've been proud to call City 17 my home. And so, whether you are here to stay or passing through on your way to parts unknown, Welcome to City 17. It's safer here. This must be a mistake. I got a standard relocation coupon just like everybody else.
about that beer I owed you. It's me, Gordon. Barney from Black Mesa. Hey, sorry for the scare. I had to put on a show for the cameras. I've been working undercover with civil protection. I can't take too long or they'll get suspicious. I'm way behind on my beating quota. Yes, Barney, what is it? I'm in the middle of a critical test. Sorry, Doc, but look who's here. Great Scott! Gordon Freeman! I expected more warning. Yeah, you and me both, Doc. He was about to board the express to Nova Prospect. Well, Barney, what do you intend? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Alex is around here, somewhere. She would have a better idea how to get him here. Well, as long as he stays away from checkpoints, we should be okay. Listen, I gotta go, Doc. We're taking enough chances as it is. Very well. And, uh, Gordon? Good to see you. Okay, Gordon. You're gonna have to make your own way to Dr. Kleiner's lab. Oh, man, that's what I was afraid of. Get in here, Gordon, before you blow my cover. Pile up some stuff to get through that window and keep going till you're in the plaza. I'll meet up with you later. I also detect some unspoken questions. Do our benefactors really know what's best for us? What gives them the right to make this kind of decision for mankind? Will they ever deactivate the suppression field and let us breed again? Allow me to address the anxieties underlying your concerns, rather than try to answer every possible question you might have left unvoiced. First, let us consider the fact that for the first time ever, as a species, immortality is in our reach. This simple fact has far-reaching implications. It requires radical rethinking and revision of our genetic imperatives. It also requires planning and forethought that run in direct opposition to our neural presets. I find it helpful at times like these to remind myself that our true enemy is instinct. Instinct was our mother when we were an infant species. Instinct coddled us and kept us safe in those hard scrabble years when we hardened our sticks and cooked our first meals above a meager fire and started at the shadows that leapt upon the cavern's walls. But inseparable from instinct is its dark twin, superstition. Instinct is inextricably bound to unreasoning impulses, and today we clearly see its true nature. Instinct has just become aware of its irrelevance. And like a cornered beast, it will not go down without a bloody fight. Instinct would inflict a fatal injury on our species. Instinct creates its own oppressors and bids us rise up against them. Instinct tells us that the unknown is a threat rather than an opportunity. Instinct slyly and covertly compels us away from change and progress. Instinct, therefore, must be expunged. It must be fought tooth and nail, beginning with the basis of human urges the urge to reproduce. We should thank our benefactors for giving us respite from this overpowering force. They have thrown a switch and exorcised our demons in a single stroke. They have given us the strength we never could have summoned to overcome this compulsion. They have given us purpose. They have turned our eyes toward the stars. 
Let me assure you that the suppressing field will be shut off on the day that we have mastered ourselves, the day we can prove we no longer need it. And that day of transformation, I have it on good authority, is close at hand. building, then the whole block. They have no reason to come to our place. Don't worry, they'll find one. I thought you were a cop. He's one of us. Look at him down there. I told you they'd be coming for us next. Just this once, I hope you're wrong. I can't take it anymore. Everything's gonna be okay. What are we going to do? I think there's something. Attention, residents. Miscount detected in your blocks. Hey, you! Cooperation right here. with your civil protection. Head for the roof! Turning There's no time to lose! Ration the wall. Attention, all citizens in local residential blocks during your inspection position. Get in here, quick! Keep moving! Head for the roof! Dr. Freeman, I presume. We better hurry. The Combine can be slow to wake, but once they're up, you don't want to get in their way. Dr. Kleiner said you'd be coming this way. 
<laughs> I don't think it occurred to him that you might not have a map. I'm Alex Vance. My father worked with you back in Black Mesa. I'm sure you don't remember me, though. Man, a few words, aren't you? Remember him from Black Mesa? Your old administrator. <laughs> Don't get my dad started on Dr. Breen. Through here. Hello, I am lead developer, Philip Victor, and I'd like to welcome you to Half-Life 2 update and its brand new community commentary mode. This latest version of the update was certainly the most ambitious version yet, and has taken 3 years of development to get it just right. My goal is to create an experience where long-time fans can replay the game they love in a new and improved form, and first-time players can have an experience that's closer to modern visual and technical standards while also maintaining and respecting the 2004's original sensibilities, gameplay and concepts. This community commentary feature aims to provide information not mainly on the development of the update itself, but on the development of the original Half-Life 2 using research and community input. To listen to a commentary node, put your crosshair over the floating commentary symbol and press your use key. To stop a commentary node, put your crosshair over the rotating node and press the use key again. Consider joining the official Steam group to give me your impression and suggestions and stay on top of Half-Life 2 updates news. Thanks and have fun. Welcome. We opted Welcome to label to this Steve as a community Steve. commentary as opposed to developer commentary for several reasons. First and foremost, we were not developers that worked on any official release of Half-Life 2, but also because we wanted to approach this commentary not as a developer, but as fans of the game. I was responsible for creating most of the commentary, with the help of several other Half-Life fans and members of our Steam group. Any nodes pertaining to the development of the update will be read by Victor and myself, and any nodes with facts and insight into the original Half-Life 2 and its development will be read by Ross Scott and our friends from Did You Know Gaming. Many people pitched in a lot of time and energy to make this happen, and I hope it will be something you enjoy. Thanks! Chosen, this train station is our first introduction to City 17 and the world of Half-Life 2. Valve's level designers had to carefully craft every aspect of this scene to convey its oppressive atmosphere. This sort of environmental storytelling was something that Valve pioneered back in the days of Half-Life 1, and it allowed them to flesh out a setting without ever taking control away from the player. One advantage of Half-Life 2's approach when compared to Half-Life 1's opening train ride sequence is that players can explore at their own pace, and learn a lot of additional information by interacting with the characters. All of these techniques are key parts of maintaining the player's sense of immersion, and are quite prevalent throughout the first few chapters of the game. To establish my this first sighting here. of a Bordagon serves two purposes. It's a reminder of the events of Half-Life 1, and it's a sign of how the situation has changed since the Black Mesa incident. A member of a race who was once a foe for the player now complacently sweeps a station platform while a civil protection officer hovers nearby. The Vortigaunt's subservient posture and lack of hostility towards the player is one of the first indications that the human and Vortigaunt races have met a similar fate. This sequence clearly illustrates the division of humanity into loyalists and lower middle class individuals. The contrast between the faceless metro cops who have traded away their humanity for power and the terrified citizens clinging to their few remaining shreds of normality shows the relationship between the two factions perfectly. Something that is made evident over the course of the game is the Combine's treatment of Earth and everyone on it as commodities, shipping people from one place to another and harvesting them with only token regard for how their loss affects anything else. The citizens' prison-style uniforms are some of the first indications of this, though the theme is reinforced later by the Combine's use of part biological, part mechanical synths from their previous conquests. Sorry, Doc, but Barney and Dr. Kleiner were developed from the generic scientists and security guards of Half-Life 1. The entire supporting cast of the original Half-Life consisted of only a few voice actors and character models, so Valve decided to distill the characteristics of those NPCs into fully developed, fleshed-out individuals for Half-Life 2. 
The state-of-the-art facial animations and detailed visuals of the Source engine gave Valve great tools to tell stories of a much more personal nature, and they've used these tools to create a core cast of iconic characters that lend far more weight to the storyline. The infamous pick up that can segment serves a dual purpose. It puts the player in the place of one of this world's downtrodden civilians, while also teaching the player how to interact with this world he or she is now a part of. As this was one of the first games to pioneer fully interactive physics-based worlds, players were shocked not only because they were asked to pick up the can, but because they could. Actions speak louder than words, and because the encounter takes place solely within the mechanics of the game, the player is free to respond exactly how he or she chooses, and can roleplay Gordon in a more meaningful way than with a dialogue option. This moment has become an enormous inside joke with the Half-Life community, spawning many parodies and references. Breen's speeches demonstrate some of the game's most interesting characterization because they provide not only his motivations and some local news, but they also betray the internal conflict that's central to his character. It's clear from the rehearsed and detached sound in his voice that he's likely to have put a lot of mental effort into justifying his decision to sell humanity into eternal servitude and conformity. His lofty, transhumanist rhetoric often seems to be as much to convince himself as it is to the citizens that he addresses. This is the player's first view of the outside world, and the Citadel is what will immediately draw the player's attention. Since it is first viewed while aligned with the Breencast monitor atop the obelisk, it is easy for the two to be instantly connected in the player's mind. The Citadel's gigantic size not only shows the Combine's immense power, but also allows the player to see it from many locations throughout the game, anchoring the player within the world and building it up as the location for the final struggle. When designing Half-Life 2, the team at Valve decided on an Eastern European setting and wanted City 17 to appear to have grown naturally over time like most cities in Europe. To achieve this realistic look, they started by first designing the older buildings, and then added in layers of newer and newer buildings from different eras. Finally, they added the Combine architecture, for example the barricades, catwalks, watchtowers, and of course the Citadel, to show that the Combine are now a part of the city's history. Several times throughout this commentary, there are references to Half-Life 2's realistic look. Those familiar with Half-Life 2 will know it is, in fact, quite stylized, so I'd like to explain what this means. Half-Life 2 is based on our world, and it tries very much to have a good sense of realism, something it carries over from its predecessor. Guns and items don't hover, rotating in midair, characters have realistic proportions, and much of the in-game architecture is based off of, or inspired by, real-world buildings. Half-Life 2 is stylized, but it has a bent towards presenting its world in a realistic way, and that's the issue we are discussing. In early versions of Half-Life 2, views of citizen life were restricted to minor window glimpses. The development team had plans for a rooftop segment, but had no existing designs for getting the player up there from the courtyards and streets. By adding in the apartment building, players were then able to interact with the citizens who would not speak to them on the streets, and gain further insight as to how citizens live under Combine law. The televised breedcasts inside citizens' homes reveal the extent to which the Combine's propaganda has intruded into every aspect of the citizens' lives, contributing to the dystopian, prison-like feel of City 17. The very simple act of allowing players to unplug the TV and fling it out a window lets these players express some rebellion towards the Combine while showcasing Source's physics system and the freedom it offers. These two citizens, who are known as the sad couple, or the consoling couple, show up multiple times throughout the Half-Life 2 series to illustrate the emotional impact that Combine rule has on Earth's enslaved population. Though their poses never change, their dialogue does, and it branches out into more direct exposition regarding the current events within the world. This shows the player how others react to their actions, creating the illusion that the game's world is far larger and more dynamic than the current map being played. 
The apartment block raid was added later into the game's development, and Valve was initially worried that players would not feel compelled to run, causing the sequence to be confusing and overly difficult. When playtesting started, however, players would panic, but almost always know what to do. Upon escaping the raid through the attic, players often felt as though they had barely escaped. Up until this point, City 17 had only been viewed by the player from the ground level. This rooftop escape provides a clear, bird's eye view of the city to greater establish the location that will become central to the rest of the game, with a nice sense of scale. The Combine air and ground forces visibly mobilizing also offers the player a brief glimpse of the stronger foes that will be confronted directly later in the game. Have a map. Alex Vance is a character that is central to the Half-Life 2 saga. The close-up view that the player sees after she takes out the Metro Cops places her into the spotlight, way, setting her up as a central character while showcasing Source's revolutionary facial animation technology. To ensure that the player's attention continues to be on Alex during these introductory moments, a convenient elevator ride removes any distractions from the area as the player becomes acquainted with her. Her dialogue there and in the segments that follow provide context for her character and explains her relationships to the other characters that players have already met.